Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Miss uh, Talk series for this week. Today we have Patrick Carrington, uh, an assistant professor in oh, my notes in the Human Computer Interaction Institute in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. His research emphasizes the design of systems to support people with diverse abilities. He studies mobile and wearable technology, builds assistive devices, and explores how computing can be used to support empowerment, independence, and improve quality of life. His work has also won Best Paper and Honorable Mention Awards at Kai and Asset. So please welcome Dr. Carrington. Yay. Virtual applause. <laughs> uh, thanks, for, thanks for the introduction, Julie. Uh, so I'm super happy to be here and to be able to share my work with you all today. Um, as the title slide suggests, I'm gonna be focusing mainly on my work to building charitables. And so thinking more about designing um, accessible computing experiences, in particular, uh, mobile computing experiences for wheelchair users. So let's uh, just kind of dive right in. So <clears throat> let's start off. Uh, this is kind of my, my research on charitable computing has really been focused around this general question of how to support interaction with information and communication technologies uh, for wheelchair users. So thinking about how we can better support uh, people with diverse abilities. So this is motivated by, you know, you, you can think of the kind of ubiquity of smartphones and mobile devices as a means of interacting and connecting with one another uh, that continues to change and grow every day. The things that we're able to do from these devices uh, continuously expands. As we, you know, see this kind of growing popularity, we also see this emergence, uh, growing popularity <clears throat> of wheelchair, of wearable devices. Um, and the capabilities that these kind of wearable devices make even more convenient, you know, literally on your on your body at the palm of your hand at the wrist. Uh, one area where there's kind of unprecedented access to technology has profound potential to impact people's lives is for accessibility, especially considering people with disabilities. So, however, the technologies themselves are far from perfect. So there's a lot of work to be done. You know, think of this from the perspective of different users. Not everyone uses the same devices, nor do they interact with these devices in the same ways. So here, just on this slide, there's four images captured from one of my studies showing different hand poses that uh, users were uh, using to interact with an interactive surface. Um, and so the, you know, these different hand poses, different kinds of technologies can impact the person's ability to perform, you know, particular required gestures or to hold devices while they're performing these different kinds of motions. Notifications are off. Um, furthermore, we sometimes forget uh, or fail to consider the other assistive devices that people may be using, like wheelchairs, um, which can both create and alleviate uh, the challenges of interacting with computing devices, especially on the go. Uh, the wheelchair itself can obstruct the person's reach or make it difficult to traverse certain terrain um, or fit through tight spaces. On the other hand, the wheelchair can, can be used to carry and store those multiple computing devices, especially as they get smaller, or to hide wires for devices that are not yet in that smaller form factor, and all doing this without burdening the actual user of the chair. So what is a charitable? So my research with charitable explores the design of devices that leverage these affordances to support the needs of the user. So charitables are devices designed to fit a wheelchair form factor that maintain its shape and consider the abilities and preferences of the user. As a general approach to how I do this research, and most of this will not be new to any of you, um, I aim, mainly aim to first gain a deep understanding of how people uh, use, uh, both understanding of the people, their lives, and how they use technology, uh, the technologies that are available to them. And so with that understanding, I build solutions that meet the needs of those users or create new ones, um, either creating new solutions or adapting existing ones in order to meet those specific needs. Finally, I go back and evaluate those solutions with respect to how well they meet the needs of those users and any other kinds of implications uh, that may arise. So I don't have time to talk about all of my research in the talk, so here's a little bit of a teaser. Um, the research that we do in my lab spans a number of different areas of accessibility um, and to support a range of different abilities and activities. So for uh, de interactive devices for wheelchairs, wearable technologies and athletics, social media accessibility, um, facilitating co-design among uh, people with different abilities, 
as well as navigation, spatial awareness, and even uh, augmented and virtual realities. But for this talk, like I said, I'm going to focus on three aspects of building charitables. I'm going to talk about um, how I'm going to introduce the concept of charitables and how we leverage, how to leverage the wheelchair in design, um, how I approach actually building devices that are suitable uh, for interaction on and around the wheelchair, and then finally talk discussing how I've used charitables to support wheelchair athletes. So the first section of this uh, talk, I'm going to talk discuss about leveraging the wheelchair and, dis and describe this participatory ideation and design process that led to uh, really the concept and initial tenets of charitables. And so this arose from the problem space of, uh, you know, let's go back to kind of the initial uh, setup of motor impairments, and these can affect uh, multiple parts of the body. So we often think of wheelchairs as affecting the lower part of the body and making it difficult to walk but other upper body mobility impairments can also adversely impact the use of mobile computing devices. Um, and finally, you know, as we think about, again, how the wheelchair might also exacerbate these existing challenges. So the question that kind of drives this, you know, how can we design devices and interfaces that better support people with diverse abilities? Again, so just a reframing of that first question. Um, in this, uh, in order to get to this point with charitables, what we started with doing was, you know, we started by understanding or aiming to understand individual challenges or individual technology challenges from discussions and design sessions with individual wheelchair users. We then took the results from those individual interactions uh, into uh, focus groups with a broader range of users, with a broader range of stakeholders, namely uh, physical and occupational therapists, along with wheelchair users to gain a broader perspective on how these solutions might meet the needs or potential solutions for multiple users rather than focusing on a specific individual. And then from that, we went back to individual, uh, individual interviews with uh, power wheelchair users to discuss in the individual configurations and their preferences um, regarding the different uh, outcomes of those focus groups. And so to kind of start this off, to give you an idea of what, we've, what we saw during kind of the individual portion, um, I'm gonna tell you a story about Kyle, um, we'll call so Kyle is a pseudonym for one of our participants. And so Kyle uh, has paralysis below the neck resulting from a spinal cord injury that he had when he was about 12 or 13. Um, as a result of this, he you know, does not have full paralysis below the neck. He is still able to move his head and his left shoulder um, and uses a head array to control his wheelchair. So there are uh, an array of switches that are mounted around the headrest of his wheelchair. So he can tilt his head to one side and hit a button or he'll tilt uh, back to hit a button. Um, Another really interesting thing about Kyle is that he was fortunate enough to have his home completely renovated to become a state-of-the-art smart home uh, delivered by um, the Extreme Makeover Home Edition. So he has a state-of-the-art smart home which allows him to control everything in his house from a uh, tablet. So when we talked to Kyle, um, we weren't really expecting to see um, too many of these challenges given this kind of state-of-the-art renovation. So some of the things that Kyle mentioned during uh, the interview, during our design interview and design session, where that the challenges he faces are with the positioning of the tablet and being able to control um, precisely what he's doing there. And so you can see from the image on the right side of the slide, you may be able to see from the image on the right side of the slide, this is Kyle. Um, in order to use his smartphone, he actually has a tray that's mounted across his lap. Uh, the phone is then propped up and he uses a mouth stick with a stylus attached in order to hit the buttons or interact with that touch screen. Um, he does this similarly with the tablet, except the tablet is actually mounted to the side of his chair um, using a pole arm. So your, your kind of standard uh, metallic pole, it sits about three inches out to the right side of the chair, uh, comes up and then places the tablet in front of him for him to use uh, with the same means. Um, one of the major things that uh, we saw from Kyle's experience was that even despite his complete home makeover, um, when they designed his home, they considered the dimensions of his wheelchair, but they didn't consider the dimensions of the tablet that they were adding to the chair after the fact in order for him to control all of these wonderful features. So the doors ways were widened, but not quite enough for him to actually fit through them with the tablet attached. So he can open the doors in his house. He can turn on all kinds of devices, adjust environmental controls, um, but he actually can't fit through the doors. So he can do all this from his bedroom. Uh, but has to have someone come in and actually take the tablet off and reattach it when he leaves the bedroom. So he actually ended up not using the tablet very often and has an aide who really does a lot of the control uh, for that uh, device. So some of the solutions that Kyle wanted to use were things that would allow him to independently engage uh, some of those functions of the tablet using uh, switch-based controls. 
And so in particular, he was interested in using a control on his elbow. Since he's already using his head to control and move around his wheelchair, he wanted to be able to use that residual motion in his shoulder to be able to press a button, even if it's just one button around his elbow. And also, of course, if it were possible, then to re, uh, reimagine kind of the display mounting for him so that he would be able to actually fit through uh, the doorways. And so what, uh, what this story kind of demonstrates, and I'll go back to these um, kind of high level points for this idea of always available interfaces. So he doesn't have to have someone come and set it up or tear it down. He can do all of it, access those functions whenever he needs to do that, whenever he would like to. Also that it's tailored to his specific situation, which is not necessarily a new concept for accessibility, but is one that's really important for these types of devices. I mean, as well, the final point of kind of maintaining the silhouette or the shape of the user and their wheelchair together. So as I mentioned, the next step in the process, we uh, took the results of these interviews, we did about nine of them, um, and took these into focus groups with clinicians, where we had uh, clinicians actually work together in teams across four, day, four days um, to get a broader perspective on potential solutions. Um, we had, during each of these focus groups, participants use personas or interacted with uh, wheelchair users who were present during the focus groups to uh, guide their designs. Uh, and so we conducted four of these sessions, each one focusing on a different uh, type of interface each day. So the first two days focusing on very specific kinds of interfaces, a phone dialer and a game controller, and the second two focusing more generally on input and output techniques. As a result of the focus groups, we came out with a set of interactions. So a set of inputs that were desirable and a set of outputs that were desirable. And so the input side, uh, people talked about wearable devices, things that would act, uh, devices that would actually be integrated with the wheelchair itself, uh, gesture-based interfaces, thinking more of gestures in the air, um, in the air or on the, during, in the space around the wheelchair, and then removable interfaces. So things that are akin to the tablet style interactions that a pile used. On the output side, people were interested in projected interfaces. So rather than having to have a physical display, they could just project onto any available surface, um, actually using those add-on screens that they were familiar with. And people were really intrigued by the idea of having head-mounted displays for the kind of hands-free interaction capabilities. After we kind of compiled those uh, results, we had this set of inputs and outputs. We then took those back into individual design sessions with power wheelchair users, where we asked them to configure their ideal setup of these inputs and outputs on their wheelchairs. And so we gave them a diagram similar to the one shown here, where we could place uh, we could place any kind of input or output in any of the reachable areas that they identified. So we had them identify any area that they could physically touch or where they could physically see uh, for a visual output, could, where could we place devices that they could actually interact with them? We had them describe the functions that they, these different inputs and outputs would provide and then rank their preferences. And so the result of that step, we end up with a slightly different uh, reordering of that initial list of inputs and outputs and find that at the top of that list, we have wheelchair integrated and wearable devices um, for their convenience factors and the, the uh, capability to not modify that, uh, that initial silhouette and shape followed by removable interfaces where you can add on this complex thing, but then be able to take it off when you don't need it. And gestures just kind of fell really far behind, both for kind of privacy reasons. Um, you know, people didn't really want to be making these grandiose gestures in the midair out in the world, um, as well as just the complications of maybe having to adhere to whatever specific gestures there were required. Um, on the output side, head-mounted displays won kind of the rankings based on the novelty of the input and kind of the potential for hands-free. Um, but add-on screens were definitely highly preferred and were a you know, consistent second choice. Projected interfaces were just not, um, not very popular once we actually asked people to configure it you know, for reasons like privacy. So if I don't have my own screen, then everyone else when I project onto a wall can see everything that I'm doing um, to uh, the person who decided, the person who described their uh, club trips where they wouldn't want to have to, uh, you know, pull on this projector in the middle of a club scene to send a text message for someone to come pick them up. So some really interesting stories that kind of led to these results. Um, one of the big takeaways, like I said, was this, the concept and kind of framing around charitable technologies or charitable computing. Um, and so this is kind of the, fir the five principles that I use to drive uh, charitable design. And the first one being availability. So devices should be always on or always available. So whether you're you know, constantly using power, it should be available whenever that user um, needs to use that, whenever they desire to use that technology. Maintaining the silhouette of the wheelchair, uh, of the user and the wheelchair together. Um, I mentioned this one before, 
tailoring or adaptation, which is a very familiar concept, especially uh, for those in the accessibility domain. Um, familiarity to known devices or systems uh, really needs to be considered when we're designing. So for both the kind of learning effects of familiar interactions, as well as the common misperceptions or challenges that arise from the use of existing technologies. And then the robustness to different environments and conditions of use. So this one really stemmed from the uh, the fact that you know one of the things that we often uh, may minimize is the is the number of different environments and situations that someone who's using a wheelchair may encounter. It's often assumed that uh, perhaps someone who's using a wheelchair is not capable of going out into the world, that they spend a lot of time indoors, but this is just untrue. Um, everybody who, uh, people with disabilities, people who are using wheelchairs are doing them inside, outside, going to work, living the same kinds of lives as everyone else, and the technology needs to support um, the, the same kinds of uh, changes in environments. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to grab some water. So the, this work, this initial work and this kind of ranking led us to this next stage of what what should actual appropriate solutions be like? What should what should a charitable um, what should a charitable be? And so I'm going to talk about building uh, the just rest. And so I want to start with this uh, this image here. So when we came out of these studies and started thinking about what a charitable might look like, those wheelchair-based integrated controls, um, how can we incorporate um, these innovative input options into the wheelchair itself? And so some of you who may be uh, Star Trek fans ha or have maybe uh, encountered the bridge on the Starship Enterprise, um, which is shown here, a very older, an older version of the captain's chair. Um, but what you may not have realized um, is that this chair is what actually gives you the power of control over the ship. Whoever sits in this chair is the captain. They can interact with whatever uh, voice interface, touch screen, hand controls. They're the one who ultimately are in control of everything on the Starship Enterprise, which we know through 20 plus seasons of activities is a very, very large range of activities that you might um, might be engaged in. I mean, so the idea here was to actually provide all this functionality at the fingertips of the user. And so we got uh, you know, into this idea, but then kind of bringing it back to the kind of hard science of it, the people who would be using this device uh, may show a lot of variation in the way that they move as well as the hand positions that they use to interact with this interactive surface. Um, so in these four images, again, from the earlier slide, I show these four pictures of different hand poses that we encountered in the study. So the first one at the top left was someone who's interacting with our surface um, using a very open and kind of loose palm. So they're not able to, you know, put, apply really hard direct pressure, but they can kind of, uh, their fingers are just uh, normally spread out. And so they can pro provide light pressure across the surface. The person on the top right, has a more of a loosely clenched fist and they interact with kind of the knuckle parts of their uh, pinky finger and ring finger. The person on the bottom right, the bottom right, um, has a much more tightly clenched fist and they actually interacted with the surface using the bottom almost of their palm of their fist. And then the person on the uh, bottom left um, actually inter interacted using um, their hand, which they had actually suffered a large contraction, which was not properly rehabilitated. And so their, act their arm actually is uh, contracted over top and they actually press down with the top of their finger um, over top of the surface instead of you know, a uh, you know, palm side interaction. And so it was important that we wanted to consider all these different kinds of poses that may um, be these different hand poses, positions, and different you know, variations in how someone might actually press or perform a gesture when we were designing uh, something that made sense for the wheelchair. And so what we uh, came up with, and my apologies, this, this would have been a video, but for some reason it wasn't working, um, so I had to cut it. But the gest rest uh, that we created was a pressure sensitive input device um, for touch and gesture input on the wheelchair armrest. And so it was a device that sits on the end of the armrest of the wheelchair and enables multiple interactions in that single area um, creating the possibility of replacing um, traditional switches or switch push button interfaces, which you might typically see in this space. Um, and so what it also does, the reason why we went with force based interactions is that we didn't want to be limited by having to explicitly detect individual fingers and instead the just rest relies on pressure, which allows the uh, person to perform gestures with multiple parts of the hand or the arm, while other parts of their hands may still be resting on the surface. To give you a closer look at uh, what's under the hood, uh, we have an array of force sensitive uh, resistors, force sensors, um, which we then use to ca calculate the center of force. 
and in an XY coordinate that was connected to an Arduino microcontroller and then eventually connected to a computer. On the kind of software side and interface side, um, we just used uh, processing to create a simple grid interface which displayed the center of pressure that was being applied to the surface at any given time. And we did this to support several common touchscreen gestures. So things like taps, swipes, flicks, drags um, in the multiple directions. So we ended up with a set of about 22 touchscreen gestures. Uh, in addition to those touchscreen gestures, though, we wanted to make sure that we were fully taking advantage of the fact that this was an armrest based interface and not a smartphone. Um, so we created these five special or identified these five special gestures for the armrest. Uh, and so the first one was a squeeze gesture. So something you might naturally do if you're sitting in a chair with armrests is you may actually squeeze the ends of the armrest. And so this can be a deliberate input that we might capture. Um, the lift gesture. So if you are reading, the word is arm rest, not arm raised. And typically you will rest your arm on that surface. So the deliberate act of lifting off of that surface can be captured as an input. The punch gesture, which was by far the favorite, um, the ability to detect a sharp force that was applied to the surface or applied to the uh, interaction surface. Um, the roll gesture, which involved rolling your hand from one side of the surface to the other. And the rock gesture, which involved rolling, uh, your, rocking your hand back and forth in both directions. Uh, so while our, our initial solution was very well received, uh, we also didn't want to limit ourselves to um, kind of the confounding result of, well, maybe it's just because we put it on the edge of the wheelchair that this is a, a very useful device. So we wanted to compare the force sensitive, pressure sensitive version to other common types of interfaces you might find on a chair from a single push button switch to a multiple uh, button uh, interaction area. And then we also wanted to compare it to the kind of ideal situation of having all of the controls of your touchscreen smartphone just mounted to the wheelchair so you can interact with it without having to hold it. So we compared these, um, these different input interaction types, again, using an evaluation with both individual wheelchair users and therapists, uh, the individual users to get that kind of individual perspective for their individual needs from you know, a young wheelchair user up to a, a much older adult. Um, and then the therapist to gain that kind of broader perspective from multiple users. Um, so we had them actually uh, use rate and describe how each device would be, could be used um, and then rank their preferences uh, out of the four. And so while the results across all four devices really spoke to the form factor really making an impact uh, compared to having the push button switches around in a different place or even having to hold the smartphone, um, all of them being put in the armchair armrest form factor made it easier for them to use um, based on self-report. Uh, but the force sensitive version or the pressure sensitive version was overall preferred by wheelchair users and clinicians in the rankings and in our discussion. And this was mainly due to the flexibility that it offered um, with respect to hand position, as well as the types of surfaces that people could interact with or through. So one of the things that um, the therapist kind of instinctively did um, to test whether this was an efficacy was an um, uh, test the efficacy of the efficacy of the solution. Sorry, um, was they had these uh, foam buildups that they use often for supporting wheelchair users' hands while they're resting their arms on on the chairs. And so one of their major concerns with the uh, surface was that now that interaction surface would be below that foam, and so by adding the foam on top they wouldn't be able to interact or access the device anymore. And this was true of the touchscreen interaction, but because the force sensitive one still allowed the kind of pressure to pass through the foam to perform any kinds of touchscreen gestures that they were uh, familiar with, as well as all of the force sensitive gestures um, that we introduced using this input surface. Um, so the kind of similarity to the touchscreen, they could carry over the things that, are, that they already know about gestures and be able to tailor that to their individual needs. So at this point, um, you know, kind of what's next in the space of interaction? I just wanted to briefly mention um, some of the projects that I'm working on now that kind of build on this initial um, integrated idea of integrated controls and breaking out the different types of input. And so one of the big promising areas that I'm uh, looking at for this is uh, in AR and VR access, specifically with respect to physical impairments, wheelchairs, and the hand controllers that um, we're seeing with a lot of modern VR tech. Um, one of the big promises of VR right now, I think, is that the is the ability to be very expressive with your hands and be able to capture these really fine-grained hand motions that we weren't re isn't really possible or wasn't really thought to be possible using traditional push-button interfaces, which are incredibly limited. 
Um, but then we kind of run into the opposite problem where the technology is starting to evolve and it's starting to conform more to hands or even hand tracking. And so what is that like for someone with a motor impairment that affects their fine motor skills and their ability to create all these different hand poses in order to interact? Um, so our aim with these kinds of projects is to break down and separate those interactions and provide you know, different kind of configurations for um, wheelchair-based inputs and outputs uh, to facilitate interactions in VR. I'm gonna take a, a breath here um, and pause before I transition into more charitables for athletes. Um, I don't know if there's any like really burning questions, I can take a question or two now. Um, <clears throat> Otherwise, I'll dive right into charitables for athletes. Who do I collaborate with for these projects? So um, this is a great question, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about who I collaborate with for um, the athlete side. But often, I, I end up working with a lot of rehabilitation hospitals, rehabilitation groups. And um, depending on the project, uh, it, it, the you know, kind of subject matter experts. So for the uh, kind of initial stages of this, I worked a lot with spinal cord injury clinics and um, rehabilitation hospitals to gain access, both to gain access to uh, the communities that I wanted to reach, as well as to gain their perspective on you know, kind of multiple users in a kind of therapy rehabilitation, um, rehabilitation occupational therapy um, kind of setting. So what are the things that we can support for kind of daily living? Um, in the Charitables for Athletes project, uh, I'll mention I've collaborated with kind of national, more national groups um, in order to, you know, connect with a broader audience. I'll dive right into kind of the driving question for Charitables for Athletes. Um, so kind of building on this idea of wearable technologies and supporting um, kind of growing needs in this community, um, one of the things that um, we saw was this idea of activity monitors and fitness tracking really exploding with regard to um, activity monitors out in the world. Um, and so the, one of the, que the questions that drove this research was really how can we design more inclusive activity monitors for people with differing, differing abilities? So to kind of dive into the problem space a little bit more, um, you know, they're really gaining around the time when we started this work, um, the hundreds of millions of dollars at this point, billions of dollars invested in uh, fitness tracking and fitness monitoring, activity monitoring by all the large kind of sports and fitness companies um, and major tech industries. Um, we're seeing all of this explosion of new devices and new capabilities, but low adoption of these technologies among people with disabilities who we felt might benefit the most from these kinds of interventions from both a health perspective and from a wellness perspective. So the general approach to this, we wanted to learn more about the space. Uh, so what the space of consumer wearable devices, um, we wanted to talk about the design of these devices to see what kinds of issues maybe in the design space or in the uh, kind of marketing or implementation space um, were leading to this low adoption rate. And so we also conducted interviews with wheelchair athletes, um, coaches, people who are you know, engaged in uh, physical activity regularly. And I also conducted observations at over three years at the National Wheelchair Basketball Tournament. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. And then finally, development and testing of devices, namely a system called SpokeSense. Um, so from our, but from our early observations and explorations into this space um, of wearables for fitness, uh, the majority of the devices that we found looked and worked very similarly. You know, they had a screen, maybe a light, and roughly the same kinds of sensors. They would be able to detect certain kinds of motion. They track steps. Um, give you feedback on that. And the vast majority of these devices were wrist worn. So they essentially looked like the Apple Watch pictured here. Um, but through those studies, uh, we identified a number of different challenges that were uh, potentially impacting uh, the use of wearable technologies. Um, and there's lots, of tech, there's lots of other kinds of challenges in terms of the actual sensing um, that goes on here. Um, but especially as we consider uh, different bodies and the human response to changes or trauma uh, that happens in your body were extremely adaptable. So changes caused by traumatic uh, injuries and disabilities can really change how our bodies are shaped and our physiology. So how it works both the, from the external perspective and from an internal perspective. And so what, are, what and how we're able to adapt, what we're able to adapt to and how we are able to adapt is, you know, can be really profound. Uh, that's making having kind of a universal form, something like a wrist-worn device, 
um, really a challenge, especially when you consider the range of abilities. But the biggest challenge that we noticed from our studies um, was actually misperception. And specifically, misperception of what the devices are actually able to do, um, what, what benefits they would provide. Um, and so this quote from a wheelchair rugby player, you know, these devices, they track steps and I do not take steps. This one from an avid hand cyclist, a mother of three, who's also an elementary school teacher. Uh, I'm sitting, yes, but I'm constantly rolling around. I'm always interested to know not steps, but how much I'm actually moving around because I'm never immobile. And so what these kinds of initial interactions revealed, uh, really revealed or surfaced were that not only are the words and perceptions of the devices different um, from what you know, a general perspective on wearables might be, but the actual activities are also potentially different, um, which led us to ask, you know, what would an appropriate solution in this space do? What would it look like and how would it be used? Um, <clears throat> so why sports? I should address this question given the, all of the rest of these things here. Um, uh, in general, driven by kind of the metrics, whether they're digital or not, competitive uh, sports are driven by metrics, whether they're digital metrics or uh, physical or analog uh, collected in an analog format. They're competitive in the sense that there's already engagement with physical activity that's built in and well motivated. And so we wanted to have a space where we were not uh, competing with um, lower levels of physical activity, which are prominent among, especially among this community. And so I decided to start with wheelchair basketball as an example, wheelchair sport, um, mostly because of my personal connection to basketball and I've been playing you know, for most of my life. Um, and so over the three years that I mentioned it, uh, from 2016 to 2018, um, I was involved in managing operations and working with the National Wheelchair Basketball Association to support their national tournament. Um, and so, so to give you some background on wheelchair basketball, um, it's basketball. It was originally uh, stand-up basketball that was adapted for play using a wheelchair. Eventually, it evolved into a sport that involves specialized athletic wheelchairs and specialized uh, basketball-specific chairs. Um, and then the, one of the other more interesting uh, features of this sport is that it is inherently inclusive or it's inclusive by design in the sense that it's a sport for people with disabilities, but not all disabilities are the same. Someone's uh, motor disability might impact um, their ability to move their arms a little bit more than someone else or their have ability to control uh, their waist, um, things like that. And so what this sport does or what the sport has kind of baked into it is this idea of a functional classification system, which is a uh, you know, professionally clinically identified way of, of uh, giving each athlete a score on their ability to perform the motions required to play the sport. So whether it's arm motion, trunk control, um, wheelchair-based mechanics and things like that. And so each player is given a score from 1.0 to 4.5. And if you have five players on the court at any given time, the total number of points uh, for the team can't exceed 15. So you have to have a mix of people on the higher end of this functional scale and the lower end of this functional scale, which allows players to develop um, uh, without you know, being limited by their disability. And so this brings us to spoke sense. Um, which is, you know, graciously being uh, uh, modeled by uh, Liam here from North Carolina at the National Wheelchair Basketball Tournament. Um, so this is a result of kind of early studies with athletes that we conducted back in 2016, 2017 at this tournament. So we started off with interviews, a few interviews with athletes and coaches and a larger survey um, to understand just kind of what kinds of metrics and things people would actually be interested, what metrics, what form factors, um, how should we approach um, activity monitoring and fitness tracking in this space. Um, and from our kind of formative studies, um, we identify some of the usual suspects in terms of things you might be interested in with regard to a wheelchair. So the number of pushes, um, movement distance, speed, acceleration. Um, we also saw kind of fatigue related metrics like respiration, breathing and heart rate. Um, but by far, uh, participants really wanted access to this movement speed, acceleration and distance um, data in real time and with a, higher, with a high degree of accuracy. So one of the complaints they had with existing devices is that they just couldn't trust them because they were designed to track steps and then they're using them in this field where um, they're not actually taking steps, they're doing a lot more just kinds of motion-based activities. Um, the statement on here about form factors being extremely important seems a bit arbitrary, but I'll explain a little bit more. Um, as, we, as we dove deeper in our exploration, we initially thought that we were going to be designing a body-worn device 
um, mainly because of this access to kind of the physiological uh, aspects of, of, fi of fitness. So respiration and breathing, there, you know, you might have a chest strap or heart rate, you want something that is actually going to connect to the body. Um, but it turns out that based on the rules of the sport, uh, any kind of device that would maybe have attached to the wrist um, would have been considered jewelry and then thus not permissible in competition. So any devices that we wanted to use, um, we wouldn't have been able to actually uh, push through that uh, body-worn device in competition. In training, it would just it would be fine. Practice um, is up to the individual teams. And so athletes, coaches, uh, spectators, administrators were very interested in something that could attach to the chair for this purpose. So yay, chairables. Um, and so we started looking at you know, what had been done in wheelchair sports before. Um, there, you know, it's not new that these sports are adapted for play using a wheelchair or that activity monitors have been used to track these kinds of performance metrics, especially in sports. Um, but access to the data up until this point um, really had been delayed access. So you have maybe some data loggers that are attached to a chair um, or even some body worn devices, but often these are tracking and measuring the interactions. And then after the fact, sometimes days, months, or even uh, days or even months later, you then pull the device and analyze all that data. So in the moment, you don't really have access to any of that objective uh, feedback. And so that's what our goal was with SpokeSense or with, the, with our uh, project, our prototype device. We were specifically aimed at um, building a device that would give feedback on those uh, motion-based metrics. So we started off, we, had, uh, we built this device um, which contained uh, a photon microcontroller, a nine degree of freedom uh, IMU for motion and detecting motion and orientation changes, a microphone for adding some environmental and contextual features to the data, and then this custom housing that enabled us to attach the device directly to the, the axles of the wheelchair. Um, <clears throat> and then all of that data would then be streamed, all the data we're collecting from those sensors would then be streamed to a host device like a laptop or a smartphone, and we'd get feedback on speed, distance, uh, acceleration, braking, um, rotation of the wheelchair, and then some orientation events as well. So I would really like to share this video of, uh, of orientation change events. So not only do we text some of the obvious orientation changes that you might expect, like when an athlete has tipped completely over, um, but we can also tell when they've tilted uh, up onto one wheel, which they might do for a height advantage um, over their opponent for a block or for a jump ball. Um, and I can explain this, but it's much better if you just see it. So in this video, he shows kind of the extreme developed skill of tilting where he's balancing up on this one wheel and is able to, you know, not only take the wheel off, but then at the end of it, actually maneuver himself to put the wheel back on. Well done. Now, this is a not, this is, you know, he's a much more advanced wheelchair basketball player, arguably one of the best uh, wheelchair basketball players in the world. Um, but you can see you know, this kind of skill and how it might be useful. Um, I also wanna briefly mention um, what we use that kind of microphone and environmental sounds for. So you can imagine if we're collecting all of this data from, these, from this sensor, from these different sensors over a period of you know, an hour or two hours, in addition to kind of real time uh, access to that data in the form of the motion metrics that I showed, we also wanted a way that you could then mark or automatically mark the data stream to identify events of interest. And so in a basketball game, some of the typical things you're gonna hear are dribbling of the basketball, the buzzer, what that sounds at the ends of a quarter or during substitutions, and the referee's whistle. And it turns out these are very distinct sounds um, that we can recognize using some you know, state-of-the-art uh, state classifiers. And so we're able to achieve very high accuracy of uh, actually detecting these and inserting these kinds of events of interest into uh, the data stream as they occur. Um, we conducted, we actually test this device, we demonstrated it and interviewed um, a bunch of athletes and coaches at the national tournament in 2018, um, which, you know, took us about, you know, we allotted about a 15 minutes for free exploration and about a 10 minute interview as time allowed for the different athletes. As you can imagine, they're not really there to be a part of a research study, they're really there to win games and ultimately get uh, to win a championship. Um, so these kind of quick interactions, but we were able to demonstrate a lot of the functionality for, um, for the individual users on their own wheelchairs using our device. Um, and so some of the findings with respect to utility, I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly, um, but things like goal setting, and feedback, uh, goal setting and feedback, intuition, and the competitive spirit I wanna highlight. 
Um, so the first one in terms of goal setting, uh, some of the really kind of high high touch moments for us were when we start were able to see people making connections with being able to set goals based on known performance data. So an example of you know, knowing what, how fast Lance Armstrong was at a particular part of the Tour de France, you know then objectively how fast you need to be if you want to be, if you want to improve. But also given the kind of widespread potential for adoption, you can start to allow these kind of casual comparisons between peers or even between elite athletes in within wheelchair basketball. So Steve Serio is one of the top athletes like Patrick Anderson. And so if he's, his top speed is 10 miles per hour, I want to go 11. Uh, as far as intuition, you know, I, I, in addition to being able to compare between players, you might want to uh, do this for players with similar abilities, functional classifications, regions of the country. Um, how can I, how do I compare to other players who play the same position as me? But the big takeaway for this was this idea of supporting intuition with data, given that there isn't access to this data uh, presently. For teams that are competing with each other, you kind of know what to expect based on your intuition. You've been playing the sport long enough. You've seen the team before. But adding that objectivity gives you something to aim for and to see kind of where you really do need to improve objectively uh, based on metrics. Um, one of my favorite takeaways from this was not even something specific to SpokeSense, but something specific to kind of data use and this access to data in real time. Um, and so in the image on the left side of the screen, there's a, you know, a humble stretch of concrete with a couple of lines and a few cones. Um, but this stretch of concrete during the tournament became this really intense battleground once we involved data. So by putting the cones down initially before we set up our large display to show what the sensors were, uh, were actually detecting, um, people started to pass through the lane, they would, you know, ride through the lane, they start doing in and out drills where they ride in between the different cones. But as soon as we turned on the data display and showed them, there's this person's top speed, here's the number, the speed or the distance, the time it took them to go from line one to line three, um, it became it became something to be the best in the building. And this gentleman on the right side of my slide uh, came back to our booth about seven times to make sure that he was still number one. He came back in different chairs before and after games. He came back when he saw when he saw someone who he thought might have been able to get close to his record. Um, he came back to beat that record. And so it allowed this kind of asynchronous competition among uh, a field of athletes where at this tournament, there's about a thousand athletes playing 88 games in a weekend. And so just the idea of adding this data and making it something of another activity, another way to compete um, was a, a, a very uh, kind of touching finding for us. And then finally, uh, just being able to augment existing review practices. Uh, so the data that they're already collecting, um, during practices and games and being able to assess things like endurance and consistency across games or practices or even a season. Uh, that immediate feedback, adding additional layers for post hoc review. So things like the context uh, in the quarter, after the whistle, while you're dribbling, while you're not dribbling. And so there's, we see some uh, potential, some broader potential for spoke sense um, in terms of both, uh, in terms of feeding team management. So I mentioned the functional classification system. If you can start to pull metrics on individual players and understand how your individual players perform, even in different game situations, you can start to understand which players you should substitute in at what times. If you need faster players, you can objectively choose which players are your fastest on paper and which ones perform better in games versus in practice. We also see applications in other sports, and I'll mention this a little bit more um, on the next slide. Um, analysis for everyday activities. So this uh, spoke sense was initially designed specifically for basketball, so we're really interested in uh, the things that basketball players are really interested in. But not, not all of these are going to be relevant for everyday uses, and not all the activities are captured in a basketball game or even in a tournament. And then finally, since we're uh, providing this way of sensing all of these kinds of different motions and interactions with the wheelchair itself or through the wheelchair, we want to explore the potential of spoke sense as kind of an enabler for input. So being able to then turn the wheelchair itself into an input device for other systems. Um, <clears throat> as kind of a broader 5,000 foot view of the work in kind of competitive sports and adaptive sports, um, there we're, I'm really interested in this idea of sensing and feedback systems um, for other adaptive sports, in addition to uh, wheelchair basketball and other wheelchair sports specifically, um, there are you know, health, wellness, and fitness applications. Can we use, um, can we apply the same kinds of sensing? Can we go into these other sports and understand their technology use and the roles of technology in both facilitating and enabling the sport, as well as transforming the sport into the data-driven 
uh, machine that we see professional sports as now. I'm pretty sure baseball players still actually play baseball, but it's all about the numbers. It's all about, you know, runs batted, it's RBIs, it's home runs, it's percentages. Um, that's what more people are talking about than whether these players are actually talented anymore. Um, and so that's what we're kind of seeing. And so we want to enable this um, in adaptive sports as well. And so with that, I want to take, you know, a moment to, you know, acknowledge and thank my uh, collaborators and funders who make this work possible. And then thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Yay, virtual applause and actual applause. So if anyone has any questions, please post it in the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Um, there were some questions while you were speaking. Uh, so someone asked, I'd love to learn more about <clears throat> participating both as an end user and how I might be able to become involved on the research side of things. And they're currently a research associate within U of M. Awesome. So right now, right now with the pandemic, a lot of my traditional in-person types of uh, studies and things are on hold. Um, but we are still doing a lot of the kind of interview engagement and uh, anything that we can do remotely, honestly. Um, we're, you know, considering we're figuring out ways to be able to ship sensors to people, educate people on how to attach them, how to uh, monitor them. Um, so I think there's definitely opportunities like uh, the easiest way, email me, follow up, let's, talk, let's chat. Uh, there was also some comments. Someone said SpokeSense also seems to have potential for informing public health perspectives related to health and wellness issues in environments. And yeah. someone else said it could also be used in testing environments to maximize utility uh, for simple user experience. So very exciting. Yeah, and we have a question. Problems. Yep. Thank you everyone for commenting. Uh, we have a question from Robin. And she says, this question relates to the charitable and the wearable basketball sensors work. How do wheelchair users and or how can researchers balance the usefulness always on devices, privacy concerns and perceptions of surveillance? So that is a great question. Um, as far as how our sensors work, um, the main the main distinction and one of the reasons why we also started with sports and why basketball in particular was a uh, or wheelchair sports in general, why this is a really good domain for this um, is that some of the surveillance concerns, some of the kind of always on <clears throat> perception of this, um, we're not doing this in an everyday context or not tracking you when you're not playing the sport because these sports are often using specialized equipment you then have to move from your everyday all, all my activities chair into this specialized athletic chair. And so this is the idea that the spoke sense as it, as it has been presented um, would, attach to, <clears throat> would attach to that specific athletic chair. So whenever you're doing a basketball related activity, we're monitoring that and giving you feedback, but we're not doing it when you're you know, out in the world by you know, a physical barrier. Um, beyond that, as we start to think about how this translates um, kind of outward, um, it really becomes an issue of you know how we're how we're handling the data specifically we are not keeping um we we are very cognizant of the fact that uh, the user needs to remain in control of how their data is shared how it's used and so we kind of take the idea that your host device is the one that that data gets sent to and processed on and unless you explicitly share it with someone else it remains your data and remains yours the devices are streaming over wi-fi but they're connected to another physical device um, right now we're in the process of making sure that this, um, that we can actually do that processing, moving it even from a host device and actually being able to do a lot of the processing on device <clears throat> so that we can just, you know, kind of deliver high level metrics and high level, uh, data from that. Uh, so essentially the identity of the user and the data we're collecting would be separate unless explicitly, um, connected. Um, So as other people uh, think of questions, I had one, um, how engaged were users throughout the design process? Like, uh, and how engaged did they want to be? Like, did they want to be involved in all stages or uh, did they prefer to kind of be like at just at the beginning ideation stage? So we were, uh, we were fortunate enough that I, uh, we were able to connect with users and kind of the initial before we have a device where, how should we even, how should we even start with this? We think that data is useful. Do you think that data is useful? <clears throat> um, we had users involved in, you know, I, I, again, identifying which metrics we should be looking at, 
how these things should attach. So I didn't have um, users directly involved in the actual prototyping of the, the last device, um, but they were involved at kind of check-in stages. As we built prototypes, we would go back and say, okay, here's the, here's the current prototype. What are your thoughts? How should we, uh, how should we move forward? What are the things that we should? What are the things that we should be doing? And so, over the course of those three years at the tournament, um, I really used that time to engage users and engage with um, the types of data they wanted, the types of usages of that data that they thought would be um, integral. And then, obviously, after the fact, we're like, this is what we published from that, and we'd like to get your opinions on that as well. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Thanks for the great talk. I have two questions. One, I was wondering if you could talk more about the principle of robustness in the context of charitables. What are some settings where participants discuss and express the desire for more robustness? How is this different in the context of athletes? And two, you discussed that it was possible to capture the sound of dribbling during the games. Did the capture data refer to the dribbling by an individual athlete? So these are both really Really great question. So the, to answer the first question first, um, for robustness, uh, some of the situations that um, we encountered. So imagine uh, we're talking about electronic devices, obviously. You go out and use your smartphone. One of the biggest advances in smartphones, I think, in the last 10 years is that they're much more water resistant. Um, a wheelchair, on the other hand, a lot of wheelchairs are still not very water resistant. And you have to do uh, you know, to cover up the, major, the sensitive electronic parts, they're getting better. Some of the parts are sealed more, but then we're talking about these add-on devices. So if I just attach an iPad to your wheelchair, it does not magically become waterproof. Um, if I attach any of these electronic sensors, they did not magically become waterproof, dustproof, heatproof. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to avoid or that uh, we want to stress and emphasize is that even though these devices may be prototypes, they really need to be uh, thought of in, the, in that capacity as they're, even when you're testing, you're going to need to deal with these different environments. So don't create a device that's only going to work in ideal conditions because you don't have those out in the world. Um, in the context of athletes, the robustness really came up as a function of how much impact can these devices take. Um, basketball in general is not specifically a contact sport, but wheelchair basketball, I would argue, is definitely a contact sport. You're, the chairs are flying, falling over, people are crashing into each other. Um, it happens. The major thing that we saw from our studies um, were actually uh, the participants were more scared about breaking the devices than they were worried about like anything else, like using the data or using the thing. So for the first couple of tests that we had to do, we had to reassure, uh, we had to reassure people that it's okay. Even if you break the device, that's good data for us. We want to know what it can withstand, what it can't withstand, what materials should we, what should we move up to in terms of our prototyping? Do we need to encase this thing in steel in order for it to be viable for you to use? Um, and then to your second question about uh, dribbling, um, the capture data does refer to dribbling by, um, ideally by an individual athlete. So the idea that the sensors are, so we can detect the dribbling from a certain distance away from the microphone. It's not a very powerful microphone by design. We want it to capture kind of the immediate area. So you can tell whether, uh, you know, the louder and softer of the dribbling, you can hear whether or not it's a far away dribble or a close dribble. And so we kind of use that, um, roughly use that proximity to say that it's an individual, the, this individual athlete who's wearing the sensor at the current time is, uh, is dribbling the ball. Um, this becomes more complicated once we add more sensors and have more players in close proximity. Um, and so that's an area of ongoing work to being able to discern that. Great, and we have another question. This is so fascinating. Thank you for your talk. I'm curious about battery life. Was the system able to track an entire game period without batter power issues? I'm also curious if future work might be looking at mechanical engineering, mechanical energy harvesting. Uh, yes and yes. So <laughs> the system that we use for so the battery life on our original system using just a, a, light, a lithium polymer battery um, was, I think the, we were getting around four or five hours of battery life. So it would actually make it through a full day of, of tournament competition. Um, but then you have to charge it. You know, it's a full charge takes a few hours uh, using those batteries and the chargers we were using. Um, but you can definitely track an entire game. And if you took it off after the game and charged it, perfect. Um, you don't have any issues there. On average, an athlete would be in this tournament would be playing up to four games um, per day. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of game be games being played, but you could use it for the entire time. Um, future work looking at mechanical energy harvesting. I'm 
very interested in being able to power these things using the mechanics of the chair or even other kinds of wireless uh, power mechanisms. Um, and we've explored a couple, a little bit of this, but not enough to power the sensor yet. So definitely this is a, an area of future work. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. I know there's been a lot of work on how to use vibrations to power devices. So that would be super cool. Um, does anyone else have any questions, last minute questions? I can ask a last minute question. Yep. Thanks, Patrick, for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what the most, if you, ha if you have to pick one, what kind of the most challenging part of doing the work or the research that you do has been in the past however many years? Um, I think the most, I mean, the most challenging parts of the work uh, really end up being kind of the most, um, the most fun. Um, the, I would say the biggest challenge to overcome that is like more broadly applicable is developing enough, developing the relationships that are needed to really test these in real conditions. So it's one thing, it's easy to put this on a chair and have someone sit in the chair and try it. It's another thing to get a Paralympic athlete to try this out and give you real feedback. Um, and so I'm, you know, developing those connections with kind of the national orgs and talking with them and understanding kind of their needs in order to even get kind of a value proposition out of this was, um, was probably the hardest uh, for uh, doing a lot of this work. And it's even more pronounced when we talk about in like the rehabilitation context where we're adding a piece of technology that could have positive or negative outcomes. Um, and we don't want to, we really don't want to introduce a technology that's going to take away from the rehab goals. We want to do something that's going to benefit um, everyone involved. Thanks. Any other last minute questions? All right, well, we're out of time anyways. Um, thank you so much, Patrick, for coming. This was a really exciting talk and I, I love to see all the work that you're doing for the community. So thank you all for coming. And there's, if you signed up for a meeting, you can refer back to the schedule, which is at the top of the chat. Uh, I can paste it again, just in case anybody wants to sign up for one of the last two slots, but overall, thank you all for coming. <laughs>